Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. Today, in a landmark ruling that overturns decades of precedent, sweeps aside generations of arguments about racial justice and inequality, the Supreme Court, in a 6 3 decision, six conservatives to the three liberals, effectively got rid of the use of race in college admissions at all, even for the purposes of increasing diversity. In the wake of the decisions, many colleges and universities immediately sent letters to students and alumni outlining how they are going to operate going forward. One such school was the College of the Holy Cross in Massachusetts, which is notable because that is the alma mater of Justice Clarence Thomas, whose decades-long project to destroy affirmative action culminated in a victory today. Now, Thomas did not write the court's majority opinion. That was written by Justice Roberts. But he did write a fiery 58-page concurrence denouncing race as a factor in admissions as policies that, and I quote him here, fly in the face of our colorblind constitution and our nation's equality ideal. Clarence Thomas did not always think this way. In the late 1960s, when he was at Holy Cross, he was one of just a few dozen black students at that college. As Joel Anderson writes for Slate, quote, he got admitted thanks to his good grades and a recommendation from a nun, and maybe in part because the school was actively looking for black students. It was the 1960s. It was in the wake of the Watts riots. The school had not had many black students, and it went out looking for some. And once he got to Holy Cross, well, Thomas's politics there were downright radical. He definitely was inspired by the Black Panthers. He dressed like them. He talked like them. He had a beret, he had uh, army fatigues, and he had the army boots. He wore afro. He was out there with everyone else. After completing his undergraduate degree, Thomas was accepted at a number of prestigious law schools, including Harvard, but he chose to attend Yale Law because he believed the campus's liberal politics best aligned with his own. Well, there, however, Thomas became disillusioned with his own status at that elite university. As the New York Times reported back in 1991, Thomas was accepted to Yale as part of the school's explicit affirmative action plan to admit more students of color. But he resented any suggestion that he received any special consideration because of his race. And once he graduated from Yale Law, Thomas blamed his initial inability to find work in the legal prof profession, not on the fact that many legal institutions and law firms in the 1970s were still redoubts of racism and white supremacy and had racist hiring practices and did not want to hire him, but rather on the belief that his degree had been tainted by the implication of affirmative action. He had his Yale Law degree and he had a 10 cent stamp stuck to it. You know, like a 10 cent price tag stuck to it. Because he's like, yeah, this is what it's worth, right? 10 cents, right? No more. He came to blame affirmative action for the rejection he felt. Now I knew what a law degree from Yale was worth when it bore the taint of racial preference. I was humiliated and desperate. Eventually, Thomas found a job in the office of the conservative Missouri Attorney General John Danforth, who recently told the Slow Burn podcast that he hired Thomas in part because of his race. My ambition was that the AG's office was to be the best law office in the state. Now, did I also think that it was important to have a diverse office? Yes, I did. And did I think that it would be wonderful to hire Clarence Thomas for that reason? Yes. But the most important reason was I had to get the job done. From there, Thomas Starr continued to rise in conservative legal circles, a rise that, according to his ex-girlfriend, was again predicated in part on affirmative action. In 1982, the White House offered Thomas a big promotion, the chance to run his own federal agency. The trouble was that agency was the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. This was exactly the kind of role Clarence Thomas didn't want, a position focused on race and discrimination. He didn't want to be there. He was resentful that he had not been offered something that uh, a white person would want. Thomas was in a bind. He wanted to keep rising in the administration, but he didn't want to rise this way. He didn't want anyone to think that he had gotten a job because he was black. Of course, <laughs> Every job he had ever gotten was because he was black. Now, I want to be absolutely clear here. No one is saying that Clarence Thomas was unqualified for any of the long list of jobs. Even his critics, his harshest critics of his jurisprudence, 
will concede, can concede, that he is undoubtedly one of the most, if not the most, important and influential legal minds of his generation. But that mistaken belief that race-based consideration, diversity-based consideration, and some elusive concept of true merit abstracted from that are mutually exclusive is the foundational lie on which today's Supreme Court decision was built. It was that belief, however, that helped secure Thomas's legal legacy. Thomas was eventually appointed to the D.C. Court of Appeals by President George H.W. Bush, and just two years later, Bush nominated him to the Supreme Court to replace the retiring Justice Thurgood Marshall, at that point the only black person to ever sit on the nation's highest court. The president called Thomas the best qualified person for the job yeah. and denied that he selected Thomas to replace the retiring Thurgood Marshall because he's black. And the fact he's minority, uh, so much the better. But that is not the factor, and I would strongly resent uh, any charge that might be forthcoming on quotas when it relates to appointing the best man to the court. Again, same thing here. Thomas was both qualified for the position on the court, as were probably several dozen folks, maybe more. He was also nominated due to the obvious political motivations in replacing the nation's first black justice, Thurgood Marshall. During his confirmation hearings, Thomas was asked about his own vocal opposition to affirmative action. The question is directly in entry to Yale. Were you part of an affirmative action quota? Were you part of a racial quota in terms of entering that law school? Um, Senator, I have uh, not during my adult life or during my academic career been a part of any quota. Uh, the effort on the part of Yale during my years there was to reach out and open its doors to minorities whom it felt were qualified. Uh, and I took them on at their word on that. Um, and I have advocated that very kind of affirmative action. Just think about that moment for a second, right? Now, having seen some of this man's trajectory in his bio, right? The thing he hates more than anything that wounds his pride, that enrages him, is to be viewed as being less than or not qualified, as being an affirmative action case. And yet, at every key juncture in his life, he's asked about it over and over again. And for Thomas and the conservative majority in the court, it all boils down, again, to this nebulous concept of merit, of qualified, who is deserving of opportunities and who's not. But I think that misses the point. It's really a question about what kinds of institutions and really what kind of society we want to have. Do we want a society in which people like Clarence Thomas, from the small town of Pinpoint, Georgia, just several generations removed from slavery and Grim Crow, Jim Crow, are selected, nurtured, and encouraged, or ones in which they don't go to Holy Cross, and they don't go to Yale, and they don't end up in the courts. And instead, those schools and those institutions pick more sailing team members and legacies. One of the things we saw today, and we saw a lot, we're going to talk about it, was a brilliant man who was able to overcome centuries of institutionalized prejudice, who was able to come from the most unlikely of backgrounds, with the help of a system designed to accomplish just that, turn around and pull the ladder up behind him.